At the end of the day, sex really does dictate everything about our lives. It really does. Hey guys, welcome to episode 18 of the Science Centric Podcast. I hope everybody's doing okay given the pandemic that's going on. Uh, I'm hunkered down here in Brooklyn with my family and we're all doing well. If you're stuck at home and you have don't have anything to do, this episode hopefully will take your mind off the bad stuff happening in the world right now. In this episode, we're speaking with Karen Bondar. She's a biologist, writer, TV host, and public speaker. Karen is probably best known for covering the topic on the forefront of everyone's mind, sex. In various forms, she's documented all the strange and fascinating ways that animals approach the enterprise of reproduction, including the animal called us. As a presenter, Karen's appeared in shows for Discovery, Netflix, and an independent online series called Wild Sex, which has reached millions of people worldwide. She's also the author of several books. Wild Sex, which shares the name with her video series, looks at all the weird and wacky ways that animals mate and rear their young, drawing parallels to our own human condition. And her latest book, Wild Moms, published in 2018, focuses on the postcoital side of reproduction, which is all about the survival of offspring. And if she wasn't busy enough, she still holds an adjunct professorship at the University of Fraser Valley in British Columbia and leads expeditions to Borneo to help citizen scientists discover new species. In our interview, we spoke about how she went from a crayfish biologist to a stay-at-home mom to a television host, what humans can learn about sex from animals, whether the human animal was ever designed for monogamy, and much more. But before we dive in, a quick reminder that we need your support to keep this channel going. One way to do that is becoming a member on Patreon. For a small monthly donation, members get benefits like early access to new episodes and their names mentioned in the video credits. Head over to sciencecentric.com support for more info. Other ways you can show your support that don't cost a dime are liking and sharing this episode and of course, subscribing to the channel. All right, enough of that. Let's get into it. Karen, thank you so much for coming on the Science Centric podcast. So awesome to have you here. I followed My your work, pleasure. followed you for years um, online. Um, this is our first time talking face to face. And um, just thank you so much. My pleasure. And likewise, it's so <laughs> awesome to run in these circles and then come back together and talk for a little bit and then go off and see what everyone's doing. It's awesome. Thanks for having me, Eric. Yeah, sure. Um, so I, I have a ton of questions for you. I think we, I think our interests align a lot because I'm, I'm super interested in evolution and, um, you know, how animals approach reproduction and, 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 you know, I'm a biologist and, and worked in genetics for a number of years. So, so I think we have some, some similar interests. Um, so I have a ton of questions for you basically. (laughs) Um, but, um, before I dive into the sciencey stuff, what I was wondering, what, what I wanted to do was just um, for for the audience is just to learn a little bit more about you. Mm. Um, so, you uh, online, you sort of present yourself as uh, the biologist with a twist. <laughs> what is the twist? <laughs> so yeah, that's a great question. I. The twist has kind of evolved, itself has evolved through the years. Initially, I put that um, as as my homage to a strong twist of lime and a gin martini. That was my, <laughs> that was way back in the day. Um, and, uh, you know, it was always just to kind of throw a little bit of uh, emphasis behind doing something a little differently, sort of taking that natural history vibe and doing the cool science storytelling that I like to do, but also just, just doing it in a little bit of uh, more of a performance kind of a way yeah Uh so the twist is generally that performance (laughs) factor that i like to add and you have some kind of performance background right like you did dance or something like that i grew up as a dancer yeah so i grew up kind of on stage and i you know at the time it didn't uh it didn't occur to me that i would use all of the stage practice for science but um it worked out that way and it's it's really great and i feel like 
you know, even now that's kind of come full circle. I just finished doing a campaign with the Girl Guides of Canada <laughs> uh, where it's like, you know what? Stay in STEM, stay in science because you just don't actually know. I, it never occurred to me that I'd be a scientist. I just was a performer. So then, yeah, when science started coming into it, that's when it sort of the magic really started happening. Yeah, it's cool. It's cool when people can combine their interests together. Um, and, you know, I think with science, it's, it, it's, seen, it's a little more difficult. Um, because it seems so abstract and kind of removed from everyday life. Um, but but it's neat that you can incorporate something like dance into, you know, or <laughs> performance into, you know, science. It's it's neat. It's pretty fun. I, I'm loving it. I'm loving the journey so far, that's for sure. And as far as, um, you know, working as a scientist, so you studied crayfish oh, yeah, uh, right. and fresh freshwater ecosystems. Now, yeah. how did you go from... <laughs> studying crayfish and in, in river streams to you know, presenting for Discovery Channel. Um, and, yeah. and you don't have to tell the whole story, but what, what's the abbreviated version there? You know, how did you totally. get there? The abbreviated version. And, it, you know, and I actually that's a question that I get quite a bit because it's something um, I think a lot of you know, naturalists are, are interested in knowing. It's kind of bridging that gap between the academic world and the media world. And I don't really think there's a set of steps that, lead you there. I think we all kind of tumble into it in our own random ways. Um, but for me, the way that it worked out was simply a, a matter of my own personal biology. I was literally at home. I have four children and I was at home. I think I only had two when I finished my PhD. And yes, I was very much involved in um, food web ecology and very much more disciplined, um, more stringent aspect of ecology at that time. And then um, as I, I had my two more children and I was very much ensconced in motherhood and I started blogging and writing as kind of just a way to keep myself sane. I, I mean, I, it's such a huge part of my life. It's such a huge part of what I love and what makes me tick as a person. I couldn't just kind of leave that behind when, when the kids came along. And so my early work was kind of a reflection of just needing to keep doing science of some kind. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one interview kind of led, leads to another one and then somebody sees you at something and then somebody asks you about this and then that's kind of how it goes. And I, I essentially took a took a leap of faith on a, doing a program very early in my career. Like before science on YouTube was really a thing back in 2012, I just got a call from a production company in South Africa that said, hey, we want to do a show. We think you would be good. We want to do it about the evolutionary biology of sex. We want you to write it. We want you to come here to South Africa and host it. And, you know, the beauty of the Internet as opposed to t the television world, which I still I also love, but it's much more tricky. Um, is that, you know, within six weeks, I was on a plane to Durban and we just went and did it. Like, you know, that's the internet. You can just do these things and <laughs> you can throw it up there and see what you get. You know, maybe it'll yeah. stick and maybe it won't. And that show ended up really sticking and being um, a vessel for, for many more projects. I feel like I'm still kind of gain, reaping the rewards of that project. Yeah, and, and that was the Wild Sex Project. Um, yeah, that was the very first series. Um, so that became, that was a, its own series. And then that became a, a TED talk and a book. And that became another series that <laughs> that be, was also had the same name, Wild Sex. But then I think there was some kind of legal issue with that. So, uh, um, so then it got changed to something else. And that was an animated series. So I mean, yeah, you know, people just, and you, you hit the nail on the head when you said the intro. It's a, it's a subject, sex is a subject that we are all, you know, designed to be obsessed with. It's survive right. and reproduce. Like that's what we are meant to be doing as animals. And so I love how sex kind of pervades every single <laughs> area of our lives. Even though we may not realize it, yeah. you can probably trace pretty much everything in your life down to your sex habits. I love doing that, especially if I get invited to a room of bankers or something, you know, <laughs> if you know you're all here today because of your sex life, by the way. Yeah. Well, yeah. And it's a, uh... It's an it's an area that that everybody has an opinion about and everybody's interested in, and yeah. and great, great like you said for cocktail parties and and it's <laughs> yeah. it's, it's it's sort of an easy in to to talking about science and talking about genetics um, and life on Earth. I mean, um, so many aspects of science: ecology, social science, evolution, physiology. Um, there's just so many ways that you can you know you don't have to 
it doesn't have to necessarily be about the act of copulation. You know what I mean? Like right. every aspect of our of our social being and how we groom ourselves or how we observe the grooming practices or natures of others and just absolutely everything. I love to tease all those things out. And I think the the world is kind of ripe for that now. The internet's just been this ridiculous tool for so many reasons. And I think for those of us that are kind of interested in sharing science in, in, in wacky and kind of a little more new agey ways, it, it's a huge advantage. Yeah. So one of the things that I wanted to ask you is in that vein, and I think that's a good segue. Now, now you, let me back up. So you, you catalog, you have cataloged in, in your wild sex series and your book, all these really like sh- strange mating behaviors of <laughs> animals, strange to yeah. us at least. To them, it's very <laughs> natural. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so my question is, is there anything that we can actually learn about sex and reproduction from other animal species? Yeah. Or are we just too different? Is there, are, there, are there take home lessons that, that would help us in our own yeah, love life so or that is a great question and i think the answer will always be yes absolutely and also no <laughs> <laughs> because i think um you know evolution in its most pure form designs things that make sense and that work well in the context that they're in and so we are part of that we're part of the the process of evolution and so a lot of these same sort of themes that we see in terms of basic biological um traits or behaviors or processes those stand true for humans as well you know Mm -hmm. i mean we like to consider ourselves to be very different from the rest of the animal kingdom and our brain makes it so that we are in a lot of ways but we're also the same flesh and bone and so i think the nature of sex like all creatures have well not all creatures have sexual reproduction some have more clonal or asexual but looking at how populations and animal animals have evolved in the first place in the context of sexual reproduction is a really really interesting question and i think it really does get to the very heart of how people are feeling about sex and that also brings into it aspects of gender Mm -hmm. and things that we're sort of figuring out now at the cutting edge of science that we have genetic tools and molecular tools that enable us to say oh well maybe it's not quite as sort of cotton dry as we thought in terms of male female um sex happens reproduction happens and on and on we go because humans you know we have so many other questions like uh, what about if we don't necessarily fit into a specific gender picture or what if our sexual habits do yeah. not look like those of um you know reproducing only and i think that's where science really has a, a responsibility mm-hmm. i think as a scientist we have a responsibility to share how different that can look in the animal kingdom i think we've done well not we but just science has done a bad job of, of framing um, heteronormative behavior in animals, and um, that's, that's completely not the case. <laughs> right. <You know? laughs> um, is there is there like a specific example of that where homo homosexuality is is common in animal species, for example? Or yeah. or let's broaden that out. I mean non-procreative sex because usually i feel like when we're talking about sex in the animal kingdom we're talking about david attenborough um you know documentaries it's always like to further the species through sexual reproduction and it's like but but i think you have some examples where that's not the case (laughs) (laughs) it's gorgeous pure you could just hear him he's like and the power birds in the jungle you know like you can hear all this beautiful echoing of, of Admiral. And it, it's it's great, but I do feel as though it has contributed to us thinking a certain way about the way that the animal kingdom is. It certainly has been extremely helpful. D- don't let me make any mince words about that. It's yeah. wonderful. Uh, now with the advent of all of these other molecular tools to go with that beautiful nature, naturalist data, yes. Oh my gosh, in terms of homosexuality, so there was two two main points there that you brought up that I think are both very important. Homosexuality and sex for pleasure. And 
<clears throat> for me, as literally the person who's written the book about <laughs> the sex habits, I haven't come across a species yet that mm. isn't homosexual. I mean, every single species that I have observed to some degree does do homosexual behaviors and there's just so many good reasons for it in terms of social glue hierarchy establishment mm -hmm. practice um there's just you know getting rid of tension um not enough partners all kinds of reasons um that that make a lot of sense and that if you kind of step back from us as humans and just kind of step back and look at us as animals it really is very very similar to uh -huh. what we see in for example, bonobos and chimpanzees are our two closest uh, primate relatives, and um, bonobos are extremely sexual creatures. They solve all conflict through sex, and um, there's no prudishness about bonobos. They're very open, yeah. and you know, it's a greeting. Sex is a greeting. Sex is a thank you. Sex is a, a, a goodbye. Um, whereas chimpanzees are not as much like that. They're much more sort of coercive and violent and groupish. Um, but but just looking at those two specific organisms and seeing the the patterns or or lack thereof makes me quite comforted in seeing that humanity doesn't seem to have a specific pattern that works for everyone and that yeah, that's yeah. what I observe. The other thing you mentioned is sex for pleasure. And I think any mammal that has stimulative tissue <laughs> that we can assume is gonna have an orgasm of some kind and I mean I think that in mammals we're fairly well well established with the types of, of phenomenon that take place in males and then those parallel phenomena in females. What we know about the evolution of a penis, for example, is that a clitoris is the evolutionary sort of equivalent in females and that uh -huh. stimula stimulatory tissue. We can't assume that doesn't feel good. For other, I think that would be a bigger stretch. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. a, why would it only feel good for us? Like, that doesn't make yeah. any sense at all. So, you know, yeah. It, 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 the thing that strikes me as sort of strange is that there there is this sex for pleasure thing, but underlying it is a very real genetic um, competition going on with genes and um, sperm competition, for example, and a big one. you know yeah. further, furthering your genes into the next um, generation. So it does seem a bit weird that like sex for pleasure c can be sort of separated for that. It's a, it, there's almost like these dual purposes, but it's like, well, sometimes, you know, if bonobos are having lots of sex with each other, sometimes that's going to lead to, you know, genes being furthered in, into the next generation. So I feel like yeah. for, for us too, that's, that's kind of a hard thing to navigate. Um, it, it's impo it's nearly impossible, I would say. I think that's such a good point, especially when you have, on top of that, primate behavior like in orangutans and potentially humans where we can confuse paternity on purpose. Mm -hmm. um, and so where does that actually fit into this whole sex for pleasure thing? Like, was that sex just for pleasure? And actually, if I got some of your DNA and I'm using that now to create a child in my body, or not me specifically, <laughs> but my body's using that, um, what is my responsibility back to that other animal? I mean, in the mammalian world, the males kind of have sex and then they're gone. They don't generally stick yeah. around to know whether anything was successful or not. Yeah. Um, so in the human world, that's really tricky. It's it's basically the answer seems to be yes and no. <laughs> For pretty, and I, you know, it's funny that I can say that. I'm like a philosopher, so I don't have to have any answers. So I can just talk about it. Um, but it, it does seem to be true. Ultimately, there's a lot of ways to get your DNA into the next generation that are indirect. Mm -hmm. So if you have a lot of sex for pleasure now, it's quite possible that you become uh, quite compatible with a certain partner or a certain mm -hmm. female. And maybe later, that could lead to an easier time copulating, procreating, who knows. Mm -hmm. But then that speaks to a really high level of cognition and planning and understanding in primate or other animal brains, right. you know. Right. So that's even more interesting. It's like forward forward thinking. Like I'm going to sort of set up this relationship now because it could lead to 
you know fatherhood like, later fatherhood or later or mother later yeah Potent- and then that is absolutely true there's a lot of data to suggest that it's 100 percent happening in primate populations to you know group living ones where you know there's these things called like a pay to stay policy like you need to do something to stay in our group you have to be helpful um, and the way that you can be helpful is maybe to have like who knows like to have sex with a female or to or to not or to guard mm-hmm. a female or to guard a, an offspring that's not yours or to uh, potentially do things that are a mixture of things that look obviously to be contributing to biological fitness and then things that don't necessarily look like that but then could be in the long term. Right, right. Okay. And so you're saying that some of some of the the techniques we have now are kind of elucidating those relationships that maybe yeah. wouldn't be um, obvious just from watching. Exactly. So a really good um, one that came out of that, first of all, or back when genetic sequencing was first kind of a thing, one of the one of the initial things we learned is that there's a massive difference between what we called social monogamy mm-hmm. and sex monogamy so um that's that's a very interesting and compelling point because we were able to know that animals were able to learn that animals that are using this sort of family structure or whatever maybe going to a to the same social partner every year and that is of course a sexual partner too like a lot of birds do this and they have um you know part high partner fidelity they have high partner success yeah. They get to know each other over the years. They have a lot of sex with each other. It becomes more um, conducive to having re- offspring and raising offspring together. But when we could actually sequence the DNA of whose babies belong to who, what we find is that that is all true. But also, everyone is still also getting some on the side. <laughs> <laughs> That's basically the truth about the animal kingdom. And, you know, if you want to take that a step further and look at the whole Ashley Madison hack in the human <laughs> world, do you know what I mean? Where there's like millions and millions of men on there and supposedly not any women or not as many. I mean, it makes perfect sense. Like, it, yeah. <laughs> Just a bit. Absolutely. Um so, but you you used a phrase so social monogamy, and then the other one was was yes, sexual monogamy. Sexual yeah. monogamy. Yeah. So, and then sexual monogamy would be the definition of something that happens when when two individuals of a species only have sex with each other. Okay. Much like what we have constructed in the human world. Like we have this thing where we say we are sexually monogamous with each other. We're quite alone in the mammalian world at, at having that. And actually in the animal kingdom, there wow. are some birds, some birds, a few birds that are extremely sexually and socially monogamous. A mm-hmm. few, not many. So the socially monogamous uh, thing, when we're talking about like birds, for example, it's almost like they're just like, hey, we're hanging out together, we're a couple, and then, but really there's some other things going on on the side, but but what is the point of, of, of having that, that sort of show relationship or the, is it, is so, it, does it have to do with child, or uh, not child for birds, but does it have to do with, yeah. with off, <laughs> the rearing of offspring? <laughs> yes, exactly. That's mm-hmm. exactly what it has to do with because in the bird world, and this is that's a really good point because it's not the same in mammals. In the bird world, copulation will occur mm-hmm. and it's, you know, sperm meets egg basically and then eggs get laid. And that's a really big deal because the eggs get laid outside of the body mm-hmm. and the incubation therefore of the fertilized eggs, who's going to actually sit on the eggs can be mom or dad. And so what that means is dad actually has a valid job to do, Mm -hmm. which is not the case in the mammalian world at all. So that makes sense for social monogamy because there's a legitimate job that either mom or dad can do. You sit on Mm -hmm. the eggs, I'll go get food or vice versa. So actually birds have a lot to gain by finding a really good social partner and sticking with that partner. They have a lot to gain. Uh, from just, you know, familiar sites, familiar partners. Definitely there's biological data to suggest that familiar partners do have more offspring that are healthier. Uh Um, However, you know, evolution is that kind of, is that tricky thing where 
we can imagine, you know, if, if the birds were humans, if they had little human brains inside the little bird nest and little mama bird and daddy bird were like, oh, why don't we just stay home and watch a movie tonight? And daddy bird's like, oh, I think I'll go out tonight, you know, and <laughs> we go and we put all these human emotions on them and stuff. And really what they're doing at that point when yeah. daddy bird goes off to like get some you know another daddy bird will come and visit mommy bird in her home and that actually speaks to getting the genetic diversity of the offsprings you know keeping that high so it actually does make biological sense it's like yeah. humans are the ones who've decided that's wrong and that's improper based on what we think a relationship should yeah. look like but actually evolution thinks it should look quite different than that <laughs> <laughs> right right well i mean it it seems like if we were comparing birds and humans that there would be somewhat of a parallel there that um you know birds have to invest in taking care of this egg but human babies are these huge resource sucks for <laughs> as you're as you're well aware and i have two kids i have two <laughs> kids also so i and i have young kids and, and i'm well aware of this um, so it, th that seems like that social um, social monogamy makes sense because there is so much investment. But yeah. but just to contrast, what would be a species where that's not the case, where the the male you know there's not parental investment from the male after copulation, where it's just like you know kind of a drive by. Um, <laughs> so to speak. A drive-by serving? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, yes. And so there are, like, for example, bower birds uh -huh. are, are an example of a bird that has, you know, this lek mating system where males basically try to get uh, as many females as they possibly can. And they really don't give a female anything except a sperm donation that's it yeah. so bower bird males will have these gorgeous little homes and you know all the decorations and everything and that is to be like come and get my sperm my sperm is awesome you come and get it 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 like everyone come and get it and then that's all i'm going to give you yeah so absolutely we have well-established uh, systems in both and generally in the bird world where you see one the male is usually the one who's really decorated so you know yeah. on peacock think peacock you know that if a male is really decorated he's generally not going to help and if he's boring looking and and males and females kind of look similar that does generally mean they'll help each other because uh. nobody is really fighting to be sexually preferred mm -hmm. um, when we have a strong sexual selection then we're going to see strong sperm competition, as you mentioned as well. Um, that that brings up a really good point, which is yeah. competition and evolution at many levels of development and during many different processes. So yeah, you got it. Sperm are competing with each other. So not just the sperm between male A and male B, but male A's own sperm. Only the best ones in male yeah. A are going to compete. So there's so many levels of, of selection taking place during all of these processes yeah yeah so so you're saying that in uh for example in birds that um sort of if there is a a post sex uh investment that the species will look more similar and yes. and and in in species where the there's the, the the males just sort of one and done it's <laughs> they're yeah. they're gonna they're gonna have to show off more they're gonna have to show that they're really worthy because they're not putting anything else into it after the fact that's exactly a, okay they basically have one shot to say this is the best sperm that you're ever gonna get look at how beautiful yeah. i am and also same with you know very complicated dances or very complicated songs uh -huh. Um, if a male has a really complicated and important um, and, and energy depriving thing that he does to win a female, that's generally different than if a man can, or man, a male <laughs> will show, um, for example, in the birds that are a little bit boring looking or that are maybe a little bit more monochromatic or, or that look the same between the males and the females, what the males have to do at that time 
is show how good of a father they'll be. Mm -hmm. Um, So there will be other traits, other behavioral traits that females will look for um, to decide whether or not a specific male is for them that's not super showy. He'll have to behaviorally win her over. And that, again, that really makes sense because if he's behaving in a certain way to suggest to her that he's going to be a helper, he's going to actually stick around and do a lot with her, with the babies, then it makes sense for her to choose him. Right. So, yeah, there's all these kind of interesting uh, ways to look at how females choose. And birds are such a good example and a way to look at that because (laughs) the eggs get laid outside the body. Right. There's a whole idea of ways to do it. Right. It's so complicated. It's, it's, oh, yeah. It seems exhausting, like for just for everybody involved. Like, you know. (laughs) Like how does how do we ever do it? How does it ever work? <laughs> Is, right? Yeah, uh, it's yeah. it's so complicated. Um, yeah. and I can only imagine that that as you know, being the smart animals that we are, that it's just like insanely complex. Like all these variables that we're taking into account when we we're choosing mates that we're probably yeah. not even aware of. Right? I mean, it's. I, I agree. Yeah. And a lot of our pheromonal ones, I mean, I love thinking about things like that because, you know, humans are the the kings of washing away our cues and putting clothes over top of our bodies so that we can't see each other. We can't smell each other. We can't, you know, like, how are we supposed to know uh, to a biological extent whether a mate is good for us? Um, we make that very tricky. And and women are more um, sensitive to that, right? In terms of choosing mates, they're more sensitive to smell, uh, I think, than men are. And men take I more mean, visual cues or, or maybe not okay. more, but do you think that's true? I, I mean, that's a good, that's a good uh, point. I actually am not sure about that. I, oh, okay. You know, it's funny because I don't know a lot about humans. <laughs> I, know, I know a lot about animals. <laughs> I, I'm like humans. I mean, my experience <laughs> is all human, but I mean, I would imagine that males and female humans probably sense things very similarly, evolutionarily speaking. Um, where females can certainly be more brain based, I think males can sometimes be more physically based. Um, yeah, it's tricky though. It's tricky to make any kind of generalization. Yeah. <laughs> I just wonder if like people go on Tinder dates and they're like, wow, this person looks great. And then they smell them and they're just like, oh, like. Yes. Oh, hundred <laughs> percent. I think, and it might not even be that they smell bad. I mean, I think that's what we we call chemistry between people. Yeah. Like we call it that, and we have a term for it. And for me, that's exactly what it means. It's like your pheromones or your unspoken um, vibes, however you want to call that. But that's that's biology, and that's why we really like having virtual meetings and going to virtual things and doing AI. It's it will never replace what we can do to each other simply by existing in the same space. Yeah. Uh, for me, that's yeah. most certainly true. And so uh, currently we're in this coronavirus outbreak, which is <laughs> a very strange phenomenon. And it's it's meaning that people are not hanging out with each other. And yeah. I, I just feel like, wow, that's that's hard for any biological biologically based creature who depends on what happens when we see each other physically just that's i strongly believe that humans need to physically contact each other for that reason for the reason that the biology that's how you share the biology whether it's a smell or a you know some kind of sense it's something something tactile beyond just seeing someone Um, totally yeah Yeah. something that doesn't translate through virtual the word virtual world for sure yeah um, so we sort of touched on this idea of, of sperm competition, which I, I, I find out, I find to be one of the most, and I actually wrote an article about this when I was in grad school. Nice. Um, cause I think it's so interesting, but, um, to bring it back to, to humans and sort of this idea of monogamy. So, um, there, it's sort of well known that, um, chimps, chimps and gorillas for example are like very different so gorillas um let's start with chimps actually chimps are very promiscuous and the males have very large testicles yes (laughs) and and they engage in a lot of what's called sperm competition so like one female with will mate with many males and then this instead of the male sort of duking it out to get access the the um the sperm sort of 
compete and there's and there's all kinds of uh, ways of doing that and then on the other end of the spectrum you have gorillas where it's sort of they literally battle it out or at least you know intimidate the crap out of each other the males uh, to get access to all the females and that's sort of a winner take all um, sort of approach yeah. and they have yeah. very very small testicles um, yeah. but then humans are kind of in the middle so like in terms of you know testicle size to to body weight um, yeah. so so what does that mean um, <laughs> <laughs> what does it mean <laughs> It's, that's such a good point. And the, the gorilla and chimp example is such a good one for looking at. Yeah. What does it mean to have those big muscles versus the big testicles and the big penis? Because the gorilla has very small penis yeah. and testicles, as you said. Um, I think that humans de definitely have an evolutionary history of being more promiscuous. Yeah. So we, we have kind of those middle-sized <laughs> testicles, <laughs> and yet penis size is quite big in humans, yeah. comparatively speaking. Yeah. Um, and so I think that we've selected for more of a monogamous framework just in terms of our evolution, our, our brief evolutionary history, um, because we have smaller testicles, and yet they're still pretty big. <laughs> they're, <laughs> they're certainly big enough. Um, it, so that one is, I think the jury is generally out on whether that's actually, um, you know, the evolution of the penis in humans. I mean, there's a lot of research to suggest that there's so many mechanisms at work there in terms of female preference um, and in terms of biological success. Um, so there's yeah. the shape. The shape of the phallus is another thing that sort of changes the success of specific sperms that are coming out of that shape, if you will. Okay. Um, there's, you know, the, the head of the penis is meant to, there's some hypotheses to suggest, to suggest that that is like a scooping mechanism to like scoop out yeah, sperms that, that have been there before. Um, and so it, it seems to me like the, the amount of sperm competition is, is vast within an individual. But then you even take that to another level of scale when you have that individual competing with the sperms of other individuals. Human sperm competition, I think, is alive and well. Yeah. I I feel like even though we have set up a monogamous framework for ourselves over over the past you know several hundred years, I don't know. I don't know how monogamous we are as a species. To be perfectly honest with you, I think it would be really interesting to um, to know about genetic data and like yeah. whose whose children are really whose. I think that would be quite a funny a funny thing to know. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think there is some data to su that that says that basically we have twice as many female ancestors as we do male ancestors. Oh, interesting. Um. So hmm. I don't know what that means. I think there's different ways you can interpret that, um, because we also know that males tend tend, tend to be bigger uh, risk takers and win a lot of Darwin awards. So, <laughs> <laughs> and and also <laughs> and also are you know have higher rates of you know mental illness and Down syndrome and things like that. So mm -hmm. you know and mm -hmm. and have a wider sort of IQ spread and. So there, there may be a lot of males that just aren't being, that aren't successful in the mating yeah. game. Um, yeah. Not having anything to do necessarily with female preference. I mean, it obviously female preference preference plays a role there, but. That's interesting. That's interesting. And it, it's interesting to sort of consider that even if your social game has, um, has won it for you, your biological game might not be won. Because even if, you know, for example, a female selects a certain male, that's not guaranteed that, that he will be the, you know, provider of the successful sperm. And in fact, you know, I think generally in the Western world, we have issues with that. You know, there's a lot of times where couples are having trouble getting pregnant. And I wonder how much of that is because we've taken away a lot of the biology behind, you know, what it is that we're trying to accomplish. Uh-huh. Um, so yeah, just kind of thinking about it from, from that perspective of the different, you know, sperm competition at many, many levels of scale. <laughs> yes. It's always interesting. Um, have you by any chance read, uh, Christopher Ryan's book, Sex at Dawn? Sex at Dawn. Yes. yes. This, yeah. this comes yeah. up a lot and it's been kind of pilloried by uh, a lot of people in the sort of evolutionary biology world, but, um, 
It's been what? Uh, like it's been sort of debunked, if you will, or ah, or criticized. Okay. Um, that because basically the thesis of the book is that uh, non-monogamy is is, is sort is, of the default, and that mm-hmm. you know. I don't disagree with that, to be honest yeah. with you. I, I mean, if you look at like non-monogamy is the way it is in all chimps. I mean, in all apes and all primates, and and arguably in humans too. Other, you know, other than our frameworks, yeah. it's, that's a tricky one. Yeah. I mean, I guess I don't know a lot about the specific human history and the different cultures of the human world. I just kind of know about animals, <laughs> <laughs> and none of them are monogamous, Eric. Not even one. Not even one. <laughs> too complicated we uh, are just too complicated but it's you know what i you know why i love saying that though it's because at the end of the day sex really does dictate everything about our lives it really does you yeah. know we, we opened our conversation thinking about that theme and it's just like the the framework of your relationship you know whether you're in a monogamous partnership whether you're raising children together in your family and stuff that's actually an embodiment of your sex life Right. Um, and that I think that's why I find it so funny that people don't generally want to talk about sex, but really when we're talking about any <laughs> aspect of your life, you're actually talking about sex. So so do you find or, or have you found in your work that you tend to make particular groups of people mad? Um, <laughs> yeah. Because what I've I, what I've heard is <laughs> what I've heard from people that that study like evolutionary psychology is that they often piss off like the feminists and they also pick off or piss off the men's rights activists because they all have their own sort of pet theories about how this is all supposed to work um yeah. and do you do you find that as well i absolutely do and i certainly don't want to especially the the feminist angle is a tough one because i am a single mother of four that goes through a lot of shit to get like, you know, I get it. You know, Taylor Swift's new song, The Man, is like amazing. I'd love it. Um, and yet I see these themes in the animal kingdom. And while I still maintain that for the human animal, we do have a lot of work to do because of the size of our brain and the nature of the societies that we've created. They have not kept kept tabs with them. Right. Um, with gender equality um but sex in the animal kingdom is not this romantic respectful exchange that humans would like it to be Mm -hmm. and so yeah i i when i really break it down into this is how it happened this is what goes on this is why you know it might actually make sense biologically for maybe a male to be coercive towards a female or something but then of course how do you say that in in a normal social framework in humanity without getting your head kind of cut off right, because right. you are maybe saying coercive sex or, you know, these kind of processes are natural, but they actually are natural. And, and it's up to each human to make sure that we don't cross those lines. And that's a different, that's a totally different topic of conversation, yeah. at least for me, than, you know, than making parallels where parallels don't exist. Yeah. Well, and it, and what I often hear is that, Um, when you start comparing the animal world to the human world, you often fall into what's called the naturalistic fallacy, which is Mm. to say that just because it happens naturally doesn't mean it's good. Yeah, Um, right, right. So, Mm -hmm. or another way to say it would be just because it is doesn't mean it should be that way. Um, and, And as more kind of autonomous creatures versus animals, then we can make these these more nuanced decisions about how we want to live. But I I think the flip side of that is that it can also like sort of devolve into repression, you know, where we're sort of like repressing our, our inner animal instincts and, and, and and where's that line? I mean, I think it's, it's, and where do we, where do we draw that line at multiple levels of scale? Like, where do we draw that line as individuals? Where do we draw that line within our communities? Where do we draw that line within our, um, you know, our identities in larger communities or countries? Or like, how does that, you know, as, you know, Canadians or as Americans, <laughs> we think it's wrong to blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Um, 
that's another conundrum that comes up with the human animal that does not come up with yeah. with the other with the rest of the animal species because the sort of levels of organization with respect to how you're supposed to do reproductive biology. I mean, we, you know, at the same time we say we should, we have these big brains, we should know better than to not be, you know, than to treat each other poorly in the bedroom. However, we have these big brains. So we have all these rules for things and we've decided what is poor treatment and what is not poor treatment. And this doesn't, you know, blah, blah, blah. Like we just kind of (laughs) wreck it. (laughs) And you also have to wonder a little bit, are we just rationalizing our sort of inner drives? You know, when you're saying, when you're being judgmental towards somebody because of how they're living their, you know, yeah. expressing their sexuality or something, are we just, are we just sort of rationalizing and, you know, we have these big brains who so are rationalizing our behavior or their behavior yeah. or judging their behavior because we don't like it because it doesn't help our reproductive fitness. Um, I know. And that's what gets me about humans. It's like, why are we so bothered by the actions of other humans? I don't think other animals act like that at all. Mm -hmm. You know, like a chimp population in this area does not really give a (laughs) crap about a chimp population over in another. Like, why would they? And I think, again, that sort of speaks to the level of cognition of of us and the things we've been able to develop to be able to get into each other's business that way Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. and to kind of decide that the way we're doing it over here is actually the best way and you guys need to maybe change what you're doing over there and it it, I love sort of all going through these these kinds of ideas because I think um there is a lot of truth to it so what you speak about as far as you know our biological drives and um how can we rationalize some of our poor behavior by you know through bio through biology well my argument does remain that we probably can. <laughs> um, you know, while while everybody is quietly and patiently waiting in line at the, tr- you know, in traffic or something, the the person who always goes to the front and cuts in, they're always going to win. So it's like that's a real biological truism as far as group selection goes. Like if everyone's yeah. waiting, everyone's following a rule, if everyone's monogamous, if everyone is respecting each other – then only the one who doesn't do those things is, is uh, going to get resources. Yes, you know, that's kind uh, of how yeah. the biological game works. So yeah. there's there's just a lot of nuances there that make us very tricky animals indeed. Although if, if if you know, that that the cheater, as it were, does it too much, then, then the other organisms might, you know, gang up and say, we don't like how you've been cheating and we're going to gang oh, up right. on you and take you down, you know, so it's... Bam, exactly. Yeah. And that does happen. Yeah. That does happen. Yeah. And then what that means is that it's no longer profitable to be a cheater. Right. So then, you know, the animal kingdom kind of takes care of it in that way. Or if the cheating scenario actually is is a value, valuable one, it'll just kind of even out. Yeah. So half the population will do the cheating one and half will not. And so that's, I think, where humanity gets it wrong so often is that we have all these rules and things. We make a rule for the rule before we just allow society to kind of figure itself out yeah. uh, as animal societies do. Yeah, tricky, tricky. <laughs> it's, you know, schools of, there's schools of thought in, in terms of parenting and relationships and, you know, how to live your day-to-day life. There's certainly schools of thought uh, about how we should be doing that most effectively at all times. Yeah. <laughs> And now we've got the internet, so we can all battle each other out on Twitter on, on, on how, how it's supposed to work. The greatest experiment ever <laughs> is the internet, yes. Um, one thing that you sort of brought up uh, is the you know, size of societies. So uh, my understanding is that we, the, we sort of evolved in these groups of maybe like 200 at the most. And now we're, we're in populations of millions of people. Mm-hmm. So, you know, maybe some of these things that we're talking about that, that, that kind of reek of repression are kind of necessary to live in that, that you know, large of a size of group of, of animals. Yeah. Um, you know, that, that's something that Christopher Ryan brought up in his book is that, you know, when everybody was kind of related closely related in a tribe Mm -hmm. then paternity certainty wasn't such a big deal because maybe your brother inseminated your partner and then it's you know or you know or whatever 
then yep. it's not such a it's not such a huge deal and and parental investment is not such a huge deal because there's this tribe that's kind of supporting everybody so that's the that's the clincher so in these smaller tribes where there was where there is maybe i i don't know uh, where they are living in modern days, but yeah. where there is this kind of group conscience um, that everyone is taking care of the group. The group is the most important factor. Um, that's that's something that I think tribal and indigenous life was all about. And um, the sort of the new modern way of the world is is to not look out for the good of the group for the only reason that somebody might be cheating you. Uh-huh. So watch your back because what if that guy stole your, you know, fertilized the egg? What if that per- what yeah. if that thing happened? And I think that is sort of the almost the kicker of having such a large brain is the ability to then turn it back in on ourselves and and let it let it run rampant in a greedy way, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, which ultimately I guess we're designed to do. Although, as you said, in these smaller groups of maybe a couple hundred, maybe even smaller, I don't think that humans can have meaningful relationships with any more than a handful of people. I don't think it's possible. Um, So, yeah, when we start to increase the scale beyond that, I guess maybe we start to lose sight of what the the real meanings of of biological interactions are and how they kind of rule our life or don't. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. <laughs> it is. It's, oh wait, I I will never get tired of talking about. It. Um, what's what's what are the weirdest questions about sex that you've gotten? I I get a lot. I get a lot of wacky questions. Um, people want to know stuff about you know the stranger the penis the better. Often if there's been like a penis that's come off or that's been used as a, as a weapon, which they often are, or that they, uh, d- and sometimes in aquatic environments, the penises actually have to detach from the male and swim to find the female. Um, males often want to know if they come back. Generally, they won't come back. The same penis will not come back, but males do, and a lot of species, retain the ability to grow another one. Not true in spiders. Once a spider has lost his two petty palps, done he might as well die the other thing that i got once which i thought was very funny is why do ejaculates taste bad Mm. and the answer that i simply gave is because they're actually meant for vaginas and not mouths which you know is what it is there's a lot of factors in there salts um sugars hormones uh neurotransmitters i mean it's it's like a soup you know an ejaculate is like a it's like a cocktail of lots of stuff and I mean, it wasn't meant for for its tasty <laughs> for flavor. That, <laughs> there, that's a great there, question. Yeah. I love that. That's a good one, Anna. <laughs> well, I kind of, I guess that kind of makes sense because I know that some seeds, for example, uh, are very toxic because they don't want the animal like eating the seeds, yes, right? That's exactly right. So yeah, I, right. I could see okay. that. I could. I, that's plausible. I guess so. You know, <laughs> you never know, right? <laughs> I don't even want to know what the experiment is to figure that out. So, um. exactly. <laughs> experiment. Um, who? So, which animal uh, has the weirdest sex? I would say that the animals with the weirdest sex are definitely the hermaphrodites. Uh-huh. I and then the hermaphrodites are the animals that are both male and female at the same time. And they, because they are essentially kind of at war with each other as far as who gets to play which role, that's where you see the real violent uh, strategies, like the head stabbing and the, you know, the the neurochemical warfare to kind of appease the part of a partner that would play the male role um, Uh into playing, manipulate your partner into playing the female role. All those kind of things, those are endlessly wacky and entertaining to to think about so the, so the, so these hermaphrodites are trying to trying to kind of nullify the the role of that the, the, they don't want to be i mean that's bizarre Correct. yeah 
But, if you're uh, a hermaphrodite, it makes more biological sense for you uh, to definitely get your bases covered as far as accepting and donating sperm. But it's always easier to play the male role. So, I mean, you can always realize more biological fitness if you fertilize more eggs. Right. And then, you know, of course, if you receive sperm to fertilize your own eggs, that also increases your biological fitness. But you have a lot more work to do because mm-hmm. you're incubating the eggs. It's always easier to be the male. Right. You know, give out the sperm and you're good to go. And so, yeah, you see a lot of reproductive strategies in hermaphroditic animals then that help an individual to play the male role um, over the partner. But, I mean, these are the same organisms. So these same mechanisms are evolving in each individual. <laughs> so <laughs> it's, 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 it's really tricky uh-huh. and hard to elucidate. I mean, why would something evolve and is that evolving for this advantage or for this advantage? And who's aspect of the co-evolutionary race is this thing meant to be hitting so yeah it's 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 very tricky but again molecular data is helpful for that as well and what are some examples of hermaphrodite <coughs> so um sea slugs are oh a lot of invertebrates are yeah. so the echinoderms um snails all the sort of the land slugs um we have a lot of you know the the a lot of barnacle species are, but then a lot of barnacle species aren't. Um, a lot of crustaceans, a lot of the inverts are, are hermaphroditic. Yeah. Yeah. I know there. I know that uh, snails or slugs. Maybe there's there's some darts involved or something like. Oh yeah, those love darts are very um, dangerous. They're calcareous structures, so they're actually weapons yeah. that are meant to be. Yeah. So love darts are kind of used again in another context to basically get your partner and keep your partner <laughs> and subdue your partner um, in order to get all the, the gametes crossed channels that need to get crossed. Wow, how romantic. I know, right? <laughs> the best. So good. Karen, it's been awesome talking to you. Thank you so much. I, I learned a ton. Um, I'm glad that we that we went off in some 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 more philosophical directions that's always awesome too and um where uh can people find you um i know you have a great digital presence but where would you prefer that they find you yeah so that's a great question my website just my first and last names karen um, dot com is kind of a melting spot for all of my projects and you can kind of you can find me in and uh, any directions from there okay cool. and hey thanks for having me what a what a treat yeah. to get to talk about <laughs> philosophy and evolution like any day eric <laughs> we'll do this again <laughs> all right well if you ever find yourself in york uh, uh please give a shout and and we can That's do it in person good. that would be great perfect cheers all right cheers Have an awesome day. great to talk to you, you too bye Well, that's it for this episode. I hope that was a fun episode for you and took your mind off of any anxieties that you're feeling right now. If you learned something new, be sure to smash the like and subscribe buttons. Also, click that little bell icon to get notifications when new episodes go live. Finally, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this episode, so please leave a comment or question below. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.